horror and the gothic typically gets accommodated by that rubric of pop culture, those things have gone hand in hand. Things like uh, horror novels, Stephen King, uh, Clive Barker, films like Poltergeist when I was little or more recently, you know, the, the revamped versions of the It films, all of those things I think easily are accommodated under the category of popular culture. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I'm really happy to be with this academic, someone who, before I hit the record button, I was telling him that uh, I've known of his work from the Gothic universe and uh, from my love of uh, Dracula, especially. Uh, so we'll get into a little Gothic horror, see where we uh, bridge the gap between those two genres. Uh, but I want to introduce my guest to you all. Um, his name is Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock. And I want to say Andrew because that's our commonality together. We're two Andrews. Um, he is a professor of English at uh, Central Michigan University. Um, he teaches American literature, pop culture, which we'll get into what it's like teaching pop culture because I'm fascinated with that. Um, I was just saying to him that it's rare to see someone born in Washington, D.C., but, you know, he was also raised in Maryland, uh, earned his B.A. in English from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so kind of a Philadelphian. I'll, I'll claim him uh, here. Uh, he has an M.A. in American Lit from George Washington University. Oh, the George Washington University. That's right. They get very specific there, um, like the Ohio State. Uh, and has a uh, PhD from the Interdisciplinary Program in the Human Sciences at the George Washington University. And um, he's been at Central Michigan University since 2001. He works on cultural work performed by the Gothic. So how Gothic texts and practices give shape to culturally specific anxieties and desires. And he has a lot of texts that he's written. Um, we're only scratching the surface here but I'm really excited to talk to you, Jeffrey, today about your Broadview Press text. So welcome to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, hopefully I didn't embarrass you too much with my uh, bio introduction. Okay. <laughs> um, but so right away, I'm really curious of like, where does this fascination with the Gothic, like since that is a genre you're so passionate about in your academic writing and you know, academic slash um, public scholarly writing. We can talk about that because I feel like you bridge these worlds with the public and the academic community in such a wonderful way, which is why I can't wait to talk to you. Um, so yeah, where does this just fascination, the Gothic, how did it enter Jeffrey's universe? Well, what I've done is I've taken a personal interest and turn it into a focus of academic scrutiny. Um, I was drawn to ghost stories in particular as a little boy um, and, and developed a, a real passion for supernatural tales, which is something that has always stayed with me. I branched out as I got older, but I've always had a kind of fascination with monsters and with ghosts and with the supernatural and spooky things in general. So I kind of naturally gravitated towards that as part of my academic pursuit. Yeah, so you're saying you turned your passion into a study. I love how you phrase that. I think it's what kind of now, I taught a Broadway musical course last year. That's a deep passion of mine. I trained in musical theater. Um, literature, of course, I'm sure is our passions. But to like talk, talk about genres, I mean, even when we were conversing about your work with pop culture, like you had a really interesting way of framing it to me. I'm not sure if you remember that email exchange, but like to me, pop culture is reality TV in my life, which I'm, everyone here knows I've interviewed some like real housewives personalities <laughs> and I am so into the minutia of the narratives of the housewives. Like I just love when they dissect one little problem for a whole season, um, but you know, for you, was pop culture and the gothic, like, does that go hand in hand for you as passions? I think so. Um, 
in as much as horror and the Gothic typically gets accommodated by that rubric of pop culture, those things have gone hand in hand. Things like uh, horror novels, Stephen King, uh, Clive Barker, films like Poltergeist when I was little or more recently, you know, the, the revamped versions of the It films, all of those things I think easily are accommodated under the category of popular culture. Yeah, well, I love and I'm obsessed with Stephen King. So, you know, Jeffrey asked me if I like enjoy the Gothic and the answer is I like the Gothic, but I think I am more like in my everyday life. Um, of course, I love Edgar Allan Poe and the 19th century Gothic. Um, but I, oh, I like when it bridges the Gothic and is it Gothic or is it horror? Like psychological. I'm more of a psychological horror person. So Stephen King's Carrie, I've taught that. So I love Stephen King. I'm obsessed. That's basically my Stephen King uh, pronouncement of love, my declaration of sorts. But yeah, so was it for you when you were growing up, was it more the a film based fascination, a literature based or they all started to combine like was it the chicken or the egg? Um, they kind of went hand in hand. I think I was more literature based early on with um, ghost stories, Edgar Allan Poe and graduating then to Lovecraft. But at the same time, um, I enjoyed horror films. Uh, some, some of my memories from childhood are very specific to uh, horror television or film. Um, I remember being completely entranced, as, and I must have been seven or eight, by uh, a made-for-TV Disney movie called Child of Glass, which I'm sure would be, uh, if I were to watch it again, I, I would probably think it was kind of funny, but at the time I was really gripped because there was this little ghostly Creole girl who enlisted the aid of a living boy to help her recover a lost cache of diamonds. Uh, otherwise, she was like damned for eternity. Um, wow. And I was, it was it seemed really dark for Disney, right? And I was just kind of like, wait, when was this, Jeffrey? 78, 79. Oh, yeah. Disney had that period of the 70s mm -hmm. to 80s where they really, I mean, do you know Return to Oz? I don't know Return to Oz. I'm oh, if you like something comes, that's, <laughs> yeah, if you like gothic Disney, it is really eccentric and gothic. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, um, takes on the more gothic narrative of L. Frank Baum. So there's like the queen, is she, I forget if she's a queen, but she um, like takes over other princesses heads and like wears them and they show this in the film. <laughs> it's a decapitation scene. And mm -hmm. now that I look back, I think, wow, this is really, uh, it's basically Return to Oz as Dorothy is going through psychiatric treatment <laughs> is how it starts because they think that she's having these uh, delusions of grandeur sure. and she needs treatment. And then she goes back to Oz and the yellow brick road, it has exploded and everything is in a dystopian universe. So yeah, definitely let me know. But now I need to watch this one uh, right, right. that and you I re recommend. I remember, I'm, I remember being completely fascinated by the Haunted Mansion at Disney. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Which was the ride that I wanted to go on multiple times. Um, Poltergeist, which came out in 83, was something that remains like burned into my memory. So uh, I think literature and film and television all kind of went hand in hand in the development of my interest in the Gothic. Well, and it seems like you're kind of offering a definition of pop culture of sorts just from these examples, which is what I love is, so to you, is pop culture just what you are as a person, anyone listening, what you are absorbed by um, in your artistic life? Like it could be film, TV, magazines, uh, popular novels. So like what to you is, what makes a pop culture compared to say a niche academic subject? Okay, so does everyone know that when I'm not a podcaster, I'm actually writing academic scholarship, teaching in the university, and just doing all my queer male scholarly inquiries and analyses. So 
I am so excited to be talking about one of my favorite academic publishers, Broadview Press. They are an independent academic publisher. They publish in the humanities. Um, they produce high quality, pedagogically useful books for university and college classrooms. But as you'll soon learn, they also publish for literary enthusiasts and literature lovers. So they're always publishing with an eye towards diversity. There's so many titles from female authors, from writers of color. And for example, in the fall, we had on Ann Stevens on our podcast. So listen to that episode where she talked all about literary theory and criticism. And as you'll hear, she explains why literary theory is not, imp not important only to university scholars and to students of literature, but also to those arts and culture lovers out there, which all of you are a part of that community. So she discusses why watching Bridgerton actually requires a certain literary theory. And then we play a Wizard of Oz game where she analyzes the Wizard of Oz from all of these different schools of thought, including psychoanalysis, Marxism, feminist theory, queer theory. So what I love is that Broadview is offering 20% off with the code Ivory Tower. So head on over to their website and you will get 20% off with the code Ivory Tower. And if you haven't listened to our most recent episode with Jeffrey Weinstock, who wrote Pop Culture for Beginners, yes, the first ever university analysis of pop culture, which is really resonating with me since you all know I'm a huge Real Housewives fan, but also he wrote the Mad Scientist Guide to Composition. So I know so many of you out there teach composition or need more writing tips. Jeffrey Weinstock just came on the podcast, listened to our interview with him. And again, 20% off all Broadview Press texts. Use the code Ivory Tower. Head over to their website. The link is in our episode notes. Enjoy your reading. This episode is brought to you by Snapple. Welcome to the Snapple Market Auditory Experience. Close your eyes. Imagine you're walking into your neighborhood store. You make your way to the back and reach for your favorite Snapple flavor. You can't wait. You take a sip. Whoa, that's a lot of flavor. Mmm. -hmm. What flavor are you holding? Now, open your eyes and check out Snapple.com to find ridiculously flavorful Snapple near you. Yeah, right, right, right. I mean, that's a question that in the textbook that I published on pop culture, pop culture for beginners, um, there's a whole section that's devoted to trying to figure, to figure out what this thing popular culture is, because it's often defined as not being these other things. It's not mm -hmm. folk culture. It's not elite culture. It's not uh, this, that, or the other thing. So I kind of run through all those definitions. And then towards the end, I try to offer like a more precise definition of what we can use for pop culture. Um, so there's a handful of characteristics that I use to identify something that's pop culture. Um, it's first activities and social practices and things that people can do, usually without significant training, education, or cost. So there's a low barrier to participation, um, often associated with youth culture in particular, doesn't have to be, but typically, um, and uh, a tendency to be ephemeral. So it kind of comes and goes relatively quickly. Um, often are activities or practices that display a kind of irreverence toward established standards of quality or taste um, and, and people who seek to enforce those things. Uh, and um, they're interestingly often assumed to lack a kind of interpretive depth or complexity, which isn't a, which is something I take issue with throughout the whole textbook. Um, so there are a bunch of characteristics that I associate with pop culture. Um, it's often something that 
is individualistic in the sense that someone pursues their personal tastes or desires or passions, but at the same time, it's communal in the sense that one is uh, pursuing that together with other like-minded individuals. Mm -hmm. So there's both an individualistic aspect and a communal aspect to it. So Comic-Con is a great example, right? These oh, yeah. conventions, I mean, even Bravo has a convention. Um, so these communities, that's so interesting that there's Polk Classics, Rocky Horror Picture Show. I know you're a Rocky Horror Picture Show fan. I've read, you know, Jeffrey's examples. Um, but okay, so there's some communal shared interest. I really like that um, definition. And I think that the low cost is something I want to bring up because it does seem like pop culture threatens the academic establishment. Um, and again, I'm not trying to, I know there's a lot of academics who listen, so it's not personal, but um, that it threatens, say, having the shared knowledge of a very um, a paywall type subject, right? That you need access to a $100 journal for a subscription that, you know, a academic book is you know, not Broadview Press, <laughs> not their books, which is why I love having them as a sponsor, um, because everything is very affordable. Um, but like we know, some academic books could be $200, $300. Um, and yeah, so that it is accessible. It's for the public's consumption, right? Um, so it, where is there, it seems like though there is more of a bridge with ac the way it can be taught in, say, universities, then maybe people um, had fought back years ago, that there is kind of this new resurgence. Like, do you feel that in the university? There's this appetite to teach pop culture within the theoretical discussions that you kind of need to with students. There has been an erosion of that chasm between uh, academic elite culture and pop culture. And I think it's for two reasons. Um, mm -hmm. The first, I do think there has been a somewhat grudging acceptance within the academy that pop culture texts can have social significance and complexity. Um, mm -hmm. And at the same time, however, universities are seeking to capitalize where they can on tuition dollars and students often tend to gravitate towards courses that have a pop culture component. So there is an incentive on the part of the university to offer courses on, say, fantasy and science fiction or cult film or um, sports and literature. Uh, yes. They're popular with students on the one hand. And on the other hand, I think increasingly as cultural studies has made inroads into the university, um, there are fewer faculty members who are really resistant to the idea that pop culture has value. Yeah, well, and, you know, what I loved about when I taught, um, well, and I feel that something when I, um, I'll shout Ashley out. Ashley is like our Broadview Press marketing uh, uh, angel spirit. Um, she's a real person, but she's like a spirit with the people that she connects me, me with because she knows my genre passions. And when I saw that there was this pop culture for beginners book that you worked on, Jeffrey, I was so excited because to just have it out there as a text that, you know, is affordable, is accessible for instructors is something where we now have a language, right? You kind of just show, sh showed us the pillars so to speak, of how you define pop culture. But when I took my students during spring break to see Wicked or Phantom of the Opera, to have that experiential, to me, the classroom should be experiential, no matter what you teach. It's no matter if I, when I taught 19th century um, queer American literature, or when, you know, you teach hope fiction or fantasy literature, whatever the subject is, that there's always embedding Maybe it's that I'm teaching podcasts that relate to those topics, right? Like what we're doing right now is a form of pop culture, which is why I'm so, you know, in love with sharing this because it, there isn't a cost barrier. And um, it, it excites me that you see, and it excites me to know that you also um, think that there's more of this embracing now of pop culture methodology. Like, oh, teach Bridgerton in a Regency era course, of course. Well, I'm repeating, of course, but you know, it makes sense. Why wouldn't you 
teach what has become a fanfare in the White Lotus even, right? If you're teaching a noir course, I would teach the White Lotus, um, you know, that you can have these quote unquote high lowbrow, even though like, I'm curious, is pop culture really lowbrow? It kind of seems that that's a misnomer. Um, I take issue with the assertion that pop culture is lowbrow mm -hmm. um, because it requires just as much background and cultural competency as it does to interpret high culture texts. The difference often is our familiarity with the genre. Um, someone in order to interpret Victorian realist novels needs to have an introduction to Victorian culture and Victorian realist novels. Um, whereas somebody who has grown up on a diet of television sitcoms and animated television has been steeped in it for many, many years and don't realize that they're engaged in a process of interpretation because it's so natural to them. It's something that you're familiar with. So you don't stop and think about the interpretive moves that you're making to it. Um, I make a comparison in the pop culture book between looking at a portrait and then looking at a cubist portrait. And the cubist portrait will often strike lots of viewers who don't know anything about cubism as, you know, what the heck is that? Um, and it's because you're not introduced to the genre, what the artists are trying to achieve, the various strategies that are being utilized. Once you know those things, you can look at it and you can interpret it and you don't stop. You only stop in your tracks when you're confronted with something that can't be accommodated by the strategies that you typically use. Mm. Um, so there's just as much cultural competency necessary to interpret pop culture texts as what were conventionally called high culture texts. It's just that certain bodies of knowledge have traditionally been regarded as having more or less value. Um, it's a question I raise, you know, you can know everything about Shakespeare and that marks you as an educated and cultured person. You can know every single thing about the Simpsons. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that marks you as being pop culture competent. But why is knowing everything about Shakespeare more valuable than knowing everything about The Simpsons? Um, no, it should. One? Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, in most of our everyday lives, it's rare that I find someone who says I'm a, only a highbrow uh, consumer or I'm a lowbrow consumer, right? Aren't we always straddling? We're kind of, it's always a mix. Like whether even you're on the subway and you're reading one of those poems in action. That's a form of what you're, it's this in between. I mean, and I agree with you. I don't like the positioning of highbrow, lowbrow. I actually don't even like these terms because they are, um, it, it doesn't reflect our everyday lives. Like our everyday lives is, hey, maybe I want to tune into um, the latest Bachelor or Survivor or the amazing race. And then, you know what? I'm going to read Bolivar's Travels, right? It's, and these novels that we analyze, or Shakespeare is a great example, right? Shakespeare in its time was for, supposed to be for the masses, for the groundlings. I mean, uh, <laughs> that they could stand and throw like uh, peanuts at each other. I mean, I'm not sure that's what they were doing, but um, that they were listening to what we would think is now eloquent like high culture language, but it was actually for them just a spectacle. And um, yeah, I, I think it's so fascinating um, the way you're offering these definitions and examples that, um, what for you though in the classroom, Jeffrey, like have you had a chance to use your pop culture for beginners? Like, do you assign your own work is, I guess the first I have question. not had a, I, I use my composition book, The oh, Mad good. Scientist Guide to Composition. Um, I haven't had a chance to actually use my pop culture for beginners book yet because I haven't taught a course dedicated to pop culture since it came out. The next time that I do, I would certainly use it. Um, my university very generously makes me donate any royalties made off of my own students back to the university, all 15 or $20 worth. Um, but yeah, I would certainly use it if the uh, if, if the opportunity came up. Oh, okay. Well, I think that, um, like what I'm thinking is when you do, um, when you're in the classroom and it doesn't just have to be that you taught, um, you know, that 
you assign the pop culture for beginners, but I'm sure it sounds like in your courses, you're always assigning, say, films, TV, music, um, uh, something to do with um, what's consumed by the public. Um, right, consumed by the public. I kind of, I don't know. For me, maybe that's how I define pop culture. But um, that, what has surprised you maybe about with your teaching practice? What surprises you or what's a good example of a moment where you realized, oh, students are really, they're keyed in and they're, they need this type of teaching practice where I am, yeah. I mean, the surprise for me is always the extent to which students initially belittle their own pop culture interests as unimportant. Uh, uh, they come in with the sense that there are academic topics which are important and there are academic topics which are fun. And they take the pop culture course because they wanna deal with something fun. Um, and the moment of surprise comes when they realize first that questions of value are always ideologically freighted. So based, you know, who, what criteria are we using to decide whether something is valuable or not and whose interests are served by those conclusions. Uh, but the real kind of turning point comes as we start to take apart these pop culture texts uh, and see how they work is, is the recognition that there is a kind of complexity to them. Um, that rather than being uh, straightforward and simplistic, there's an aspect of interpretation that's involved in them. So they're actually engaged in a, a sophisticated process of making sense of their world. And then we move on from there. And the real moment comes when we start to talk about the ideological messages that are embedded within pop culture texts, the way in which they either reinforce or challenge conventional ways of thinking about the world. Um, and we look at you know, stories about the American dream, maybe. And I ask, OK, whose interests are served uh, by the presumption that people are responsible for their own success and that anybody can go from rags to riches? Um, what would happen if everybody stopped believing in class mobility that they were and started to think they were trapped in the position they've been born into? Um, and they think, well, people would get uh, upset. Um, people would become frustrated if they realized that there were institutional obstacles to their progress that they couldn't overcome. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the seeds of revolution. So it's in the best interest of a capitalist economy to make people think they are responsible for their own advancement. And that if they just apply themselves, they can succeed. Um, and, you know, you have these moments when you're talking about these narratives that are pervasive in American culture where the recognition and realization sets in. Um, and then you have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Like the American dream kind of theme. And there's so much. I've, I've touched upon that when I taught The Great Gatsby. Oh, also, shout out to Michael uh, Nallen, who uh, I interviewed on the podcast. He did the new edition of The Great Gatsby for Broadview yes. Press. Um, but right, The Great Gatsby offers so many film adaptations. And I heard they're going to be making it into a Broadway musical soon, which I'm actually happy about because I said The Great Gatsby is ripe for a Broadway musical. Um, yeah, it's but, a Baz Luhrmann piece if there yeah, was one yeah. exactly like there's gonna be i think it's gonna be a really explosive uh music well <laughs> the car accident definitely provides an explosion of sorts <laughs> um but uh, uh i think it could be really cool with the 20s um but right see there even like our discussions i feel i'm in kinship with you because we're both coming from our own um our own consumption, our own understanding of what we are drawn to and then providing a type of critical lens to it. So that's what's, I, you're right though. Like when I first entered my PhD program in 2014, I kind of remember joking about the phenomenon of Fifty Shades of Grey because it kind of had then just the films were coming out, I think. Um, and I said, wow, wouldn't it be interesting if someone taught Fifty Shades of Grey to see why there's such this erotic mass consumership like who was the readership why um you know are mostly middle-aged women being drawn to these books um there's something there and i do remember some academics kind of laughed it off like well that language isn't interesting like who would want to read those texts they're not um they're not something of note 
you know, they're not your Jane Austen or they don't have this classic emblem. Um, I mean, even some would probably be surprised that, um, you know, Stephen King is taught, which I think has always been shocking to me because he's the most famous horror writer of the 20th to 21st century. But yeah, you're right though. The tide has changed because now I really don't hear that, um, the questioning as much. And like for you, you said it's almost an old guard, a changing over of the guard or responding to the student's culture, which, yeah, I'm not sure how much we could separate that. But um, I, I also think, I don't know if you see it in your classroom, Jeffrey, but especially because you're teaching, it seems like a lot of Gothic literature, fantasy literature, that students though attention to reading they are reading, but it's in different forms that I would not be as comfortable to assign, say, an 800-page Victorian novel and be like, okay, this is what we're doing for two weeks, um, is not how I would approach that practice. I mean, I'm not sure how you fall on that in terms of, you know, what students are reading right now. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? If so, the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. Have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie, or what have you. In addition to the articles published in the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog as well as personal essays on its popular Here's My Story section. This allows people like you to share their own experiences with our readers. To learn more about submitting either to the print or the online edition of the GNLR, visit glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W dot org and scroll down to the bottom of the page to find a link to their writer's guidelines. If you have any questions, email stephen.hemrick at glreview.org. The GNLR can't wait to see what you have to say. And remember that they're offering an exclusive code with the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. So when you subscribe to the magazine, you'll receive a free copy with any print or digital subscription. So that's seven issues instead of six. Again, just visit the glreview.org and click subscribe and enter the promo code ITBR for your free issue. Right. Um, I teach a course called Monsters and Their Meanings which is, is my baby. Like it was the course that I invented. And the approach that I've settled on for that class is we do clusters where we have the classic version of a recognizable monster, say Dracula. We do an updated representation of the same monster. And then we have one or two films as part of the cluster. Uh, and the idea is to look at the way that the same monster signifies, resonates differently in different contexts. Um, I have to be somewhat careful with that class. Uh, the challenge for them are the Victorian Gothic novels. So the last time I did it, we do Dracula, we did Frankenstein, we did The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mm -hmm. um, particularly with my student population, if it's more than 300 pages, we start to run into trouble. <laughs> uh, so I do have to bear in mind length when it comes to assigning works. I find the same thing with fantasy and science fiction. Um, that length does become a little bit of a stumbling block if it's something that's excessive. Uh, sometimes it's a problem with Stephen King. Stephen King reads really well, but some of those novels are incredibly long. And I, I it, do like to, it to is work the Stephen one. King. Yeah, I can't, yeah. I couldn't do it as part of the course. Um, yeah, but I Carrie think, worked really well when I taught right. that novel. Yeah. yeah, so Carrie works particularly well. Um, I, I did do a course that was Stephen King uh, film and literature. So we like read the stories and some of the novels and then watched the adaptation as a film. I love that type of course. Um, that's and that's, wonderful. That was fun. And the real surprise for students in that course is that the best 
Stephen King films have typically been the ones that no one associates with Stephen King. So The Shawshank Redemption, Stand By Me, and The Green Mile, mm -hmm. um, all of which are Stephen King. Um, that he's got treatments of King's works have gotten better. Um, but apart from Kubrick's The Shining, there have been a lot of lackluster earlier King adaptations. Carrie is quite good. Yes. Well, yeah, I'm yeah. as you as you could tell, I'm obsessed with Carrie. Well, also, I think it works for students because of the what I was seeing is how resonant the bullying theme and coming right out of high school. It does have this immediate connection. But I remember being taught Pet Cemetery. I did. I when I first entered college, I had a um, gothic and horror literature course. It was one of my favorites. Um, I always loved watching horror films during the Halloween season, but I will always watch horror. Like I will be that person who goes to this movie theater and I'll even go by myself and see the new Scream because I just love, or I just saw the um, new Halloween. I really liked what they did with that one. Um, but yeah, there's always something, right? When you recognize, okay, this is my passion and I want to provide, provide what I'm so enamored with to my students and show them that there is a way to apply a critical approach it really translates. I mean, doesn't it, Jeffrey? Because they're seeing how enthusiastic you are and you're not just trying to get through, say, I need to teach you all of these texts because they are quote unquote important. I mean, I love Victorian novels. And I think there's a way to teach the Victorian novel. Like there's a way to teach George Eliot's Middle March that responds to pop culture. Like I would break it up. Like if I was teaching that, I would teach Middle March throughout the whole semester by making it a thematic course where, okay, how does this one marriage plot relate to say something we're seeing in a Bridget Bridgerton episode, right? Like that, but that's just how I've been taught how to teach with my own mentors is this discussion based, this responding to what the students are being drawn to. Um, so yeah, you're speaking my language. And I think that so many, <laughs> so many instructors now have this model. So they're probably all nodding enthusiastically wherever they are listening to this. Um, but I will ask, do you ever find, um, not resistance, do you, because that's not the term, but do you ever find, because um, I thought about this, especially because I teach queer topics, I teach like sex and literature ideas. Do you ever find that there's a tightrope to walk or you're worried about, well, especially when we're teaching uh, material that is for the public, there can be really steamy or juicy or, you know, sensual conversations because, um, the public's appetite for sex is, uh, you know, there. Um, do you think, do you ever think about, okay, am I um, um, breaking a barrier with teaching this material? Like even with Dracula's, um, you know, the Coppola film, because I love that version, um, even though it's so campy, but that's what draws me to it. It's highly sensual, but it's also, right, based on the novel. So yeah, how do you maybe straddle this? Am I going over overboard or not? Well, the weird thing is I have sometimes thought that I might get more pushback than I do. Mm -hmm. um, I have in various contexts brought up critical race theory, expecting to get an email, somebody hot under the collar, which hasn't happened yet. <laughs> it doesn't mean it couldn't happen in the future. Um, some of the novels that I teach, even Interview with the Vampire, which was one that I did not oh, yeah. too long ago, has a, a very pronounced homoerotic element to it, which we mm -hmm. were able to talk about within the classroom and nobody really found it particularly shocking. Um, so I, I did a section of composition this semester that was all about conspiracy theories um, and oh, we wow. talked about, you know, kind of anti-vaxxer conspiracies and the big lie involving the election. Um, and knock on wood, they, students have stayed with me almost all, like, as far as I can tell, they're with me. Um, and I haven't had real pushback. 
I'm, I'm teaching a course next semester that has a, a theme of skin. And I'm still working out quite how I want to address it. Um, that's the only time I, I, I'm sort of playing with it. It's hard to talk about skin, obviously, without skin shows, without eroticism, without sex. And, it, and I don't know how I can do it quite without pornography as at least a point of reference. Mm -hmm. um, how mm -hmm. far in that direction I can go, I'm not sure yet. Yeah. Uh, it's not well, Linda Williams about. has a lot to say about porn studies and academia. I mean, right, we have a whole category of it, but I look to those scholars, especially yeah. in our current moment. And I, well, not even current moment. I mean, I think she wrote that. What is it? Um, I have it on my shelf, but Linda Williams wrote her like groundbreaking porn studies mm -hmm. book of, oh, you can provide a scholarly analysis to porn, which is the number one searched Google search and was like, I think one of, um, is up there with uh, material that, um, uh, what is it that, um, like the Bible is the number one bestseller, but like near it is pornographic materials that it's always sold. Um, so I think it's so interesting though, that once she came out with that work, then the Academy recognized, oh, this can be, um, a topic of scholarly inquiry, but it, I think that's exactly though what your pop culture for beginners is all about is once someone um, with academic knowledge or someone who has a PhD and they devote a study to it, then it is seen as worthy, right? Like if someone came out with, and I'm, I know this exists, but I'm a, um, I've had discussions here with, um, uh, media, sex and media um, uh, experts and someone who is actually a, is a journalist and she was in Playboy about journalists and like looking into inquiries around Playboy and Playgirl. Jeffrey's like, how did we get here, Andrew? No, but <laughs> bear with me. Um, but that it does tell us a lot about culture, right? And trends and, you know, how photographs reflect the current moment and um right i mean we don't really have print issues in popularity now um everything has become digitized in a way but you're right that's an interesting question you're posing of how you're going to teach that of course built around skin i mean i don't even know even with how open i am with teaching sex and media and those conversations i don't know if i would teach you know a porn film i actually probably i'm still like oh i don't cuz i think You'd have to have a, you'd have to have a faculty and an administration that, an administration, not the faculty, but that backs you on that. Like the students are all, they know what they're getting and sign off on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You're right that porn studies is now a legitimate area of academic inquiry. I think it's also very, very siloed. Um, that mm -hmm. is anyone who's taking a course knows what they're getting because they have signed up for it. If you're taking a course that's on pornography, um, you know in advance. I think it's one of the last barriers outside of that, I think. It, it becomes much more difficult, I think, to discuss in a general class um, where students might not have signed up with the anticipation that that was gonna be part of it. So I, I'm, I haven't quite figured out how I'm gonna go about that yet. <laughs> Well, when this episode comes out, you will have figured it out. So let me know. Yeah. Update update me, Jeffrey. I'm curious. But sure. well, and um, there's been, yes, of course, there's t courses that, especially in art history courses, I mean, you can't go around the nude body. That is art history. Um, but you're right. When it's like a designated course and everyone knows, okay, I'm signing up for the nude in Western culture. We kind of know what we're getting, but I, I I think that's exactly right. Like when you're integrating that material into more of a general course, like composition or into like a survey course. Yeah, I you're right. I don't think we're at that. We're not at that point of where that's integrated and it won't be. I mean, pushback in the classroom is expected. Like I, I'm sure like me, you enjoy the academic, the scholarly debates in the classroom. To me, that's what college is for, is for those open conversations. But like, will you be backed? 
will you be supported? Like, okay, I can teach this material and I'll be supported if a student pushes back to the highest level. I'm not sure. And anyone out there, I'm sure maybe you have a story. Uh, you know, you can DM the Ivory Tower Boiler Room on Instagram and I'll, uh, I mean, we also have a TikTok too, Jeffrey. So talk about trends in pop culture. Uh, TikTok has opened my eyes to teaching opportunities um, that I think is still not really tapped into by academics. Um, there's a lot going on there um, with disseminating knowledge. Well, and actually that is a good transition into your other work with Broadview, which, um, is how you have taught composition. I love what you've done with the Mad Scientist Guide to Composition. Um, that's Jeffrey's book. And it is so cheeky. It's playful. It's satirical. You're addressing the reader personally with your first person view, which ultimately is when I teach Whitman is what's so groundbreaking about Whitman's free verse. It's the poet has the speaker address the reader. Like, hey, reader, like reader out there just questioning. And you do that with this composition book. And I loved it because it is immediately developing a bond with the reader. And like, I know you have to take this as a requirement, but hey, bear with me. You're about to go into my mad scientist laboratory. I mean, what inspired this type of book? It's so groundbreaking as an academic book. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, it, inspired by my own experience teaching composition and not being able to find a textbook that I thought met the needs of the students that I was teaching. Um, the other ones that I looked through tended to be big and dry and expensive um, yeah. and to cover, like to, to include lots and lots of, they, but they were intimidating basically. Yes. Um, and, and I think we have enough trouble with students coming in who are very nervous about their writing and to hand a student who is not comfortable with their own writing skills, a 500 page telephone book of a composition guide that and make them pay $120 for the privilege, I don't think serves anybody well. Yes. Um, so I wanted to do the opposite of that. <laughs> um, I wanted to do something that could lower the anxiety related to writing rather than heightening it and have a little fun with it. Um, so I pitched the writing assignments as experiments rather than an essay, which strikes fear into the heart of most students. And you know, an experiment is something you try out and you crash and burn and you tweak it and you try it again. Uh, I try to come up with some you know, funny prompts and, and funny examples and just to, to make something that's more entertaining, less intimidating, more fun. Yeah, well, and you do all of that. I love, like, Jeffrey has these moments where um, you'll even play around with, if you don't, if you think I'm serious right now with my joke, you can send $2,000 payable to Jeffrey Weinstock. Um, I mean, it's hilarious. And um, it kind of becomes a comedy, a comedy book meets memoir meets then the composition, which Right is your own way of entering your own genre of how to um, develop rhetorical strategies. Like this is your way of writing. And I think to let your authenticity show in that way, I instantly wanted to take a course with this book because, um, you know, I had more, I mean, I really actually have to say I loved my composition. The courses were um, a blend of genres. Like I was taught, like a novel, short stories, poetry. I mean, I think sometimes it can go in that field or it can go in the more, I'm going to teach you all about logos, ethos, and pathos. And it can become more of a philosophical composition uh, course. But I like that you, um, you combine it all. And yeah, this metaphor of the mad scientist lab with writing, writing is an experiment. I keep saying, to those like as I'm publishing work, like, you know, and I'm sure you get this with all the books you've written, Jeffrey, is how do you do it? Or um, how do these opportunities come? And I say, well, ask questions from your editors. Never be afraid to ask for their feedback, right? Never be afraid to, no, I need your critiques. Like I will even say this to those I write 
I write for, I want your revisions. Like I, I want to know where I should go next because I am not the only writer here. This is a lab group, you know, to use your metaphor framing. It's a collaborative experience writing and anyone who's published work, you know, there's a team behind them. This isn't just, I wrote and that's it. <laughs> Like, and I think for students, I think they can just see this one author's name, like say Stephen King, they'll just think, oh, Stephen King wrote this and then it came out. Like, no, right? There's editors, there's the marketing team. It's a development process. And yeah, it's what I loved about when I took chemistry courses. I loved my labs. That was one of my favorite parts is you get to make mistakes in science. You're supposed to make mistakes because you have to prove your hypothesis and it's probably not going to work out in your lab uh, when you do it, um, right? So to kind of bring that into the humanities is a really powerful metaphor. So yeah, there is a connection between science and the humanities. There always has been. Um, so no, thank you for doing that, Jeffrey. And yeah, how do st students respond to this type of framing? Hi, it's Mary from True Crime and Academia. You've heard me talk about my amazing friend Mandy before. She makes the best crochet, cre-cut, and custom home decor for reasonable prices. If you're looking for a one-of-a-kind gift or some new decor to add some new life into your home, look no further. Mandy has got you. I have quite a few items from her, ranging from a crocheted headband to Halloween decor items to my amazing and adorable Coraline ornament. Um, if you guys haven't noticed, I'm like obsessed with Coraline and I just love how Mandy makes it. She's also made me a Coraline doll that sits next to all of my true crime books. To order, just slide in her DMs on Facebook and Instagram at Mandy Made It. That's M A N D E E made it on Facebook and Instagram. Once again, go to Mandy made it on Facebook and Instagram, send her a DM and order today. Look, Bumble knows you're exhausted by dating. All the must not take yourself too seriously and six one since that matters. And what do I even say other than, Hey, <sighs> well, that's why they're introducing an all new Bumble. With exciting features to make compatibility easier, starting the chat better, and dating safer. They've changed, so you don't have to. Download the new Bumble now. Hey. I, it's been a positive response. I mean, and in and, and keeping with what you're saying, the first thing I tell them is no one naturally knows how to write a five-page paper, a 10-page paper, a 20-page yeah. paper, a thesis, a dissertation. Um, no. These are things that one learns over time. Um, right, no, yeah, you don't. Uh, also, we are all the, the worst readers of our own work because we know what it is that we're trying right. to say and it sounds good in our head. Sometimes it doesn't translate on the page. So we're reliant mm -hmm. upon other people to give yes. us feedback, to help us revise, to help us clarify. Um, revision as a strategy that I'm committed to as the best way for students to develop their skills. Um, yeah, so, and you yeah. have to license yourself to have a little bit of fun with it. <laughs> um, yeah, to yeah. not be the perfectionist. For me, that's what I had to learn is, um, I was my own worst enemy. I think a lot of us are, right, in academic writing is we get in our way of thinking this has to be, or, maybe early in your career. I'm not sure. I mean, maybe there's still anxious writers who are, I think ang anxiety and writing go can go hand in hand a lot, which is why I love your approach. Because when I'm even, when I, I'm working and was at the beginning of the dissertation, but where I am now is I'm having fun with it. Once I just said, hey, have fun with your argument. You're talking about phallic language with Whitman. And I can't believe the things that are coming out, but it's all there backed up by the text that to just have fun and realize my committee will, they'll see where these pathways can go if I haven't put in the theory or that's the committee's job to help me. Not that it has to all be tied in a box. Like, no, that's, 
And I think though, that's the anxiety is so many of us think the writing has to be tied in a box, ready to be shipped off. But once I let go of that, it opened up my writing possibilities. And, you know, and then the collaboration came, which was key to learn. So I appreciate, you know, that you're teaching students that at such a young time in their career, not even young with their age, but young in the studies, and that it can come from your book. The Mad Scientist Guide to just play around, see what happens with, you know, the drafts of your writing. Because what's the worst that can happen? Okay, you have commas everywhere, or, you know, you thought this could work with a body paragraph and you just, you know, start to dissect it like a monster's cadaver. <laughs> Isn't that the purpose, though, is to see what happens when you're moving things around? And yeah. It's, you know, do you see this in your own writing? Like, have you seen your approach to how you're teaching translate when you're writing? Like, do you think about this is what I tell my students and now I'm kind of have to take my own, have to take my advice to my students for my own writing? Um, I, I have developed over time my own approach to, approach to writing. Um, I'm fairly disciplined in working out a, outline before I get going. Mm -hmm. um, typically, um, every so often, I'll start a piece without really having the end in sight. But for the most part, um, I've already kind of worked out the pieces before I get going. Yeah, see, I'm the uh, over outliner, or I used to be the over outliner where I would like bullet point every step in the writing. And then I realized, wait, I'm having fun with the journey, right? It's good to have like, it's good to have a frame of an outline, but you don't want to think you have to hit every step because yeah, it's not going to happen. I think that's um, right. And if you find yourself yeah. heading off in a direction, but it's productive, then you see where it goes. Yeah, just like this conversation. <laughs> I mean, well, and then I saw you can start to dictate your, uh, um, like, I know you can dictate your voice for writing, but I've thought about that. And then I'm thinking, well... I'm not sure if it's going to translate to the page, but maybe I should play around with that. Hey, that's an experiment. Dictate my voice and see what happens. Um, but yeah, this has just been so wonderful. I mean, I feel like I could just keep talking to you, but I don't want to like hold you for the whole. Um, we're recording on a Saturday, everyone out there, but, you know, breaking the fourth wall. But it's been such an exciting, uh, you know, um, conversation to have on a Saturday. So. Maybe to end, Jeffrey, something that, um, you know, I want to have everyone out there maybe leave um, this conversation with is just your own feelings, your unique feelings about, you know, you wrote the pop culture for beginners. You did the mad scientist guide to composition. They're all under $30, everyone. Also, uh, we have an ivory tower boiler room discount code in our show notes. so. You know, it's great. Um, you know, the price is going to even be discounted more. Um, so what I love is all the examples you use. You brought so many of them into the conversation here. I can hear from your, how you've been talking with me. Just, I'm like, wow, Jeffrey knows this. <laughs> you know, he knows that reference, this reference, uh, this Disney Gothic film I now need to look up. Uh, but, you know, what is it? What has intrigued you about, you know, is this where you, okay, let me frame it this way. I'm curious, when you entered the profession of um, teaching in a college, you know, becoming an act, you know, becoming a faculty member, is this where you saw your writing going? Like, did you think that you would be doing more pedagogical? I mean, you have other writing, of course, of you know, uh, theoretical analysis with Gothic texts, but did you think you'd be offering all these models of pop culture, how to teach composition? My career has definitely gone in some unexpected directions um, to a certain extent. Uh, the, the dissertation, my doctoral dissertation was on ghost stories by 19th century American women. Oh, wow. Um, so, and I was 
that was a lot of archival work. And I was making the case that there was an unacknowledged tradition of essentially feminist writing on American women, by American women, in which the ghost in the house was a thinly veiled metaphor for the situation of women in American culture who weren't recognized, listened to, appreciated. Um, and there was this whole body of ghost stories. So that, that Gothic element has been a through line for me, but I came in as a 19th century Americanist. Um, and by sort of serendipity, I've ended up going more into uh, monsters and cult film, which were unexpected directions. Um, I got, this was 2007, I think, um, I had published a, a short piece on Rocky Horror and got invited to do a book on the Rocky Horror Picture Show for, um, it wasn't, I was, um, what, now it's an imprint of Columbia University Press, but I got to do the Shortcuts book on Rocky Horror, which still is kind of my claim to fame because I get interviewed routinely around Halloween about Rocky Horror. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, it's things kind of take assume directions of their own that you could never have anticipated. And it's been uh, fun to kind of build a career around questionable subjects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and you let the, um, and it seems like you let those doors, right? Once you open yourself to, okay, this isn't exactly the trajectory that I thought, and like, I thought scholarship would go, but once you surprise yourself, or that's how I felt is I'm kind of just let these experiences continue to domino like oh okay like oh maybe there is something to now talking to real housewives experts or right that you start to surprise yourself of oh there is a lot of um ways this combines into my academic work and i love that you um you know are recognizing that for all of us jeffrey i mean it's a great model like you're now a model for me of how to do <laughs> writing and um I'm actually curious, do you have, I don't want to ha like, don't feel compelled, but do you have another 10 minutes? Yeah, I'm okay. Oh, okay. Just because we do have a um, Patreon, talk about another pop culture, <laughs> uh, new phenomenon, but we have subscribers. So I would love because, you know, it wasn't exactly coming up in the conversation, but now that I know about your Rocky Horror Picture Show fascination and other cult kinds of um, pop culture iconic moments. Um, I'd love to chat with you about that shortly and just, you know, pick your brain about your favorite uh, pop culture. Sure. Cult films, horror films. Uh, so everyone, we're going to end here in the uh, Ivory Tower Boiler Room and we're going to head to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room Cafe, which <laughs> is only $5 a month for all our bonus episodes. So See you all there. And yeah, we're going to pick up with the Rocky Horror Picture Show because I have questions for Jeffrey. Okay. Bye, everyone, and see you over in the cafe. All right. Thank you for having me. <laughs>I want to personally shout out Kim Dallas, who first joined the Ivory Tower Boiler Room as an intern from Stony Brook University. She is graduating this spring, and we are so thankful that she then, after her internship, came onto the team as our film editor and audio editor, and we are going to miss her. She's leaving us, but she, we all know here, is going to have such a bright future in media Thank you, Kim, from myself, Andrew Rimby, and from Mary, and from the spring interns. We can't wait to see what you do in your career. Bye, Kim. Thank you so much for listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. This is Andrew Rimby. I really hope you follow us on social media because that's where you get to see all of the exciting video clips, teasers, and humorous moments. So follow us on TikTok and Instagram at Ivory Tower Boiler Room, and on our Twitter, at Ivory Boiler Room. I hope you all are following the Ivory Tower Boiler Room Cafe and become a member for only $5. You get all of our interviews and episodes ad-free. You also get to watch the video interviews. You get to see my lovely face and the guest's lovely face. And you get access to all the bonus episodes. So, Dr. Jake Newsom talking about the history of the pink triangle, 
Zach Topping talking about being an army vet and what that meant when he wrote a war novel and a dystopia novel. You get to hear Gregory Maguire's breaking news about the Wicked movie musical, Jesse Green talking about Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein. And what did Stephen Sondheim actually think about Rogers and Hammerstein? So head to patreon.com slash ivory tower boiler room. Please, please provide me an iced coffee. I would love it because I need to stay up to do all these edits. So yeah, see you all in the ivory tower boiler room cafe. And here is Mary DePippi from True Crime and Academia. Hi, everyone. I am Mary DePippi. As Andrew said, I am the host of True Crime and Academia. True Crime and Academia airs on Fridays at 730. Now to find all things True Crime and Academia, you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at True Crime and Academia or on Twitter at TC and Academia because, well, they hate it when you have too many characters. Like I said, True Crime and Academia airs on Fridays at 730s. But if you are a subscriber, you get a bonus episode. That's right. A whole episode just to yourselves that no one else gets to hear. Like I do a deep dive on the case of Jean Benet Ramsey. I deep dive Casey Anthony. We talk about the history of the lobotomy. And most recently, we talked about the Night Stalker himself, Richard Ramirez. So. If you want to access all of that extra wonderful content, go to patreon.com slash ivory tower boiler room. And like Andrew said, if you could just please buy us a nice coffee, that would that would be great. That would be really, really great. It would be great. We appreciate it. We also interact with all of you on Patreon. So ask us your insightful questions. We will answer them for you. And we want to thank our spring 23 interns. Andrea, Caitlin, Rosie, and Sheila, thank you so much. And we can't wait to see you all back again in the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Happy winter, everyone.